Good morning and welcome to worship on this, the fourth Sunday of Advent. Thank you for joining us here at First Evangelical Lutheran Church. And let us continue with the call to worship. The power of dreams lies in waking up. For when we close our eyes, we can see a better world. When we close our eyes, we can dream a better dream. But when we open our eyes, we begin the work of faith. The power of worship is the same. When we enter this space, we can see a better world. When we enter this space, we dream a better dream. When we enter, when, but when we leave this space, we begin the work of faith. So come in, dream your dream, find hope here. For in an hour, we, we will begin the work of faith. Let it be so.
light the candle of love. I dream of music that makes my heart swell. I dream of trees that take my breath away. I dream of sunrises that wrap me in light. I dream of family dinners that feel like home. I dream of church services that give me hope. I dream of love as the default. So today, as we draw near to Christmas Day, we light the candle of love. May this light burn bright as a reminder that God is here and God is love. We are not alone. Thanks be to God for a love like that. Amen. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. Have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. And for peace throughout the world, for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have 
Together, let us pray. Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. With your abundant grace and might, free us from all the sin that would obstruct your mercy, that willingly we may bear your redeeming love to all the world. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from 2 Samuel chapter 7. Now when the king was settled in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent, a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be a prince over my people Israel, and I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies before you. And I will make for you a great name like the great name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may live in their own place, and be disturbed no more. 
and evildoers shall afflict them no more, as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 89. We'll hear the response, and then I'll sing it, and then we'll go right into the psalm. Our second reading this morning is from Romans chapter 16. The Apostle Paul writes, Now to God, who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but is now disclosed, and through the prophetic writings is made known to all the Gentiles according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For this day according to Luke the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, 
for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her, who has said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace be to all of you on this day. From God the Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. I have come across a fair number of people in my years as a pastor whose main stumbling block block with Christianity is the virgin birth. A woman once told me quite emphatically that the story of the Virgin Mary is extreme to her. Having a science background, she just couldn't accept it. Now, the people who raise these concerns are faithful and thoughtful people who know about basic human anatomy and reproduction. And so when such a seemingly central part of the story can't be explained, well, the whole thing quickly unravels for them. Now, it's never really been a, such a big problem for me that Mary conceived without a man's assistance. I suppose if God can create the giraffe, beluga whales, the color purple, and jackfruit, then a birth without the normal coupling of sperm and egg isn't such a stretch of the imagination. But I often wonder if we're not missing the whole point when we get bogged down in the details of the divine conception. I find it interesting that Mary's virginal state is mentioned three separate times in the story from Luke, once in the Gospel of Matthew, and never again in the entire Bible. Mary is mentioned many times, of course, but her famous pregnancy, that is the precise modus operandi, is only mentioned these four times. You'd expect to find more. Search high and low, though, and you won't. It is theologically and intellectually fine with me that Jesus came into the world in this virginal fashion. I say the creed every Sunday with gusto and don't flinch at the tough parts. But I sometimes wonder if Mary's virginity doesn't overshadow the real miracle in the story. The thing that I find most fantastic and incredible is not how the Son of God finally wound up bellowing on barn straw, but that somebody like Mary chose to risk her reputation and say yes to it all. Mary said, okay to God, I'll do it. So the operative word for me here is not how, but rather that. Philip Yancey tells a story about a young woman in his church in Chicago, an attorney who stood bravely before their congregation one Sunday morning and confessed a sin that everyone knew already. We had seen her hyperactive son running up and down the aisle every Sunday, writes Yancey. Cynthia had taken the lonely road of bearing an illegitimate child and caring for him after his father decided to skip town. Cynthia's sin was no worse than many others, and yet, as she told us, it had such distinct consequences. She could not hide the result of that single act of passion, sticking out as it did from her abdomen for months until a child emerged to change every hour of every day for the rest of her life. No wonder the Jewish teenager Mary felt greatly troubled. She faced the same prospects, even without the act of passion. The thing that impresses me most in this story about the Annunciation to Mary in Luke's Gospel, occurring nine months prior to that first Christmas, is not how Jesus comes into the world, but rather that Mary says yes to God's call. One morning, she is happily dreaming about her upcoming wedding and life with Joseph, her fiancé. 
And the next day brings morning sickness and a story that will become increasingly difficult to explain to friends and family. Christmas cards often depict the bumpy road to Bethlehem as the lonely couple makes the arduous and dangerous journey from Nazareth. Heck, I'd say they were glad to get out of town given the months of whispering from the neighbors. So tell me, which is the greater miracle here? The virgin birth or the virgin's unmistakable girth after telling God, here I am? It can be a frightening thing to place oneself in the hands of God, to tell God, yes, here I am. I have absolutely no doubt that the Lord is my shepherd, a consoling, comforting presence. Mary's own experience also teaches me that God's call is often not necessarily something one would personally choose if given the option. Her reaction to this call is not filled primarily with joy and happiness at first, but rather resignation and great fear. Mary was initially filled with perplexity and a ponderous spirit. A colleague once told the following story about his son, Lucas. Lucas, like other children, didn't um, accept new news without probing the cause. Upon learning that my colleague had accepted a new call and they would be moving to South Carolina, Lucas kept boring into the purpose for their families leaving their home in Virginia. Why? Why are we moving, Daddy? Lucas pleaded. My colleague tried to explain to him something of God's call. Lucas's reaction, though, in reply must have been similar to Mary's first gut reaction, even though it's not printed in the scriptures. Lucas had summed up the feelings of the entire family when he spoke about with shades of the prophet Jeremiah. Well, if God is calling, tell him, tell him to be quiet because I'm not listening anymore. If Mary didn't say that out loud, surely she thought it. Mary eventually resigns herself to God's call when the angel says, the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And of course, we have read that text to symbolize how Mary will become miraculously pregnant by a divine agent. But I read that angelic promise differently these days. In this life we're given, it's always going to be a struggle between the will of the Most High and our own will. Inherent in any call will be this struggle to see who will overshadow the other, whose will will win out. C.S. Lewis said it well when he suggested that in the final analysis there are only two kinds of people. Those like Mary who say to God, thy will be done, and those people to whom God finally says, thy will be done. And the angel said to Mary, the most high will overshadow you. The you in that sentence is important. To be overshadowed by God meant a demotion of what Mary wanted, what Mary was expecting for her life. It meant a scrambling of her future. To be overshadowed and relinquish the self for God's use must have brought on the morning sickness faster than the child who would soon grow inside her. I know I've personally wanted to vomit many times upon learning the consequences of a particular call. What I'm trying to describe here, this fearful, overshadowing call of God is not just for famous virgins, and it's not just for people who happen to have graduated from seminary. God's overshadowing call rests upon all of us, all the baptized who have also been ordained with water and the word. One of the authentic marks of this call is that we'll initially want to run the other way, retreating to safe ground and what has worked before, a truth amusingly illustrated by one of my favorite theologians, the late Yaroslav Pelikan, in his book, Whose Bible Is It? He writes, the, Bi the language of the Bible can be like a set of dentist's instruments, neatly laid out on a table, intriguing in their technological complexity and their stainless steel, highly polished look, until they set to work on the job for which they were originally designed. Then, all of a sudden, my reaction changes from how shiny and how beautiful they are to get that darn thing out of my mouth. God, it seems, will not let us linger very long with the sweetness and light of Christmas. Let us look to Mary for courage in our calls from God and look further beyond her pregnancy to the Savior who will help us answer them. 
She was, after all, his, her son's first disciple. Even here, early on, she bears the cross. Here I am, she says, hopefully for all of us. Let it be with me according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Together, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God of power and might, fulfill your promise and come quickly to this weary world. Hear our prayers for everyone in need. Gracious God, all generations call you blessed. In this holy season, we pray for our neighbors of other denominations and faiths. Inspire the faith of their people. Cultivate understanding among us and strengthen us in love and service to our community. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Creator God, you scatter the proud. Everything we have belongs first to you. Bless and protect the seas, mountains, plains, forests, skies, and soils that surround us. Give us humility as we tend them. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Righteous God, you humble the powerful and lift up the lowly. We pray for the leaders of all the nations, that they amplify the voices of people in need. Guide all people entrusted with leadership to create societies to which everyone can flourish. 
Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Compassionate God, you fill the hungry with good things and send the rich away empty. Nourish those who lack access to adequate food and nutrition. Bless the work of advocates, community organizers, and food pantries. Encourage others to provide for their neighbors in need. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Healing God, you pour out mercy to all who cry to you. Surround everyone in need of healing in body, mind, or spirit with your tender presence. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Draw near to us, O God, and receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Gathered into, into one by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive now the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. As we go on our way, we do so singing. Beloved, go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.